Welcome, friends, to our worship. I am thankful for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, during this time of prayer, listen to each heart and each mind that is joining with me right now. You know them. You hear them. You hear their hearts. You hear their minds. You know their deepest needs, their deepest fears, their greatest joys. I pray that you would reach out and touch them in a special way, encourage them, lift them up, give blessing upon blessing that can only come from you. As we open your word today, speak to us. May you be honored in Jesus' name. Amen.
From Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 28. If you have your Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 12. We'll begin with verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is here, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Heavenly Father, we want to be close to the kingdom. Just as this one, Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. So draw us near. Use us as your people in your kingdom and teach us today as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great Sunday we had last Sunday here on the campus. We had one service. We had a meal following that service, a great time of fellowship. We filled up the pavilion with folks and lots of laughter and communication and talking. It was just a great time of fellowship as we ate together. I had several folks make comments last Sunday. This was great. I love this. I wish we could do this all the time. I enjoyed seeing people I don't normally get to see. And on the list goes of those who enjoyed our time together. But I think the best part of it was, and what made it so great, really is tied to the sermon of last Sunday. The disciples were arguing over who was the greatest. Even James and John asked to sit at Jesus' right and left, even after Jesus confronted them in this discussion they had been having. He said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you become the least. We are called to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus. And last Sunday, we all had to deny ourselves by adjusting our schedules. Some had to deny themselves by sitting in a different place. Some denied themselves as we did a, a blended service with a couple different styles, and denying self by participating in maybe a style that's not a preference. And we had the real heroes of the day were the ones that really denied themselves and made sure we had a great meal. We are called to become the least, to become servants. And what a great, great time we had in the four nights of our family VBS, where we as a church served our community and we gave away, and we are giving away quite a bit from this time of service as we have humbled ourselves to serve those in need. Well, today in the message, I want to recap the lessons that those who were here participated in during the four nights of our family VBS. And this first lesson that we focused on will lead us into a time of communion on Sunday night. We looked at John 13, 1 to 17, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Now, in the order that Jesus explained for his kingdom, it very much contradicts the order found in earthly kingdoms. From John chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share 
with me. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. He already got a sneak peek on the, the screen of the first lesson that we learn from this event in history, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The first lesson is about humility. And this is the lesson that I have focused on over the years in Jesus becoming the servant in the room. That they were disciples, had been arguing for days over who's the greatest among them. And this, this uh, argument came to a head in the upper room. As they entered the room, there was the towel in the basin right there by the door, but no servant. And they come in and they sit on the floor around the table, perhaps on, on cushions, but it was common to wash their feet to keep themselves clean and the room clean. But the servant was not there. And they're arguing over who's the greatest because really they wanted to know who's the least among us, who is the last one in, lowest on the totem pole, who's going to wash feet and become the servant. And while they're trying to figure this out, Jesus gets up, take off, takes off his outer garment, wraps a towel around him, takes the basin that he pours water in, and he goes to wash the disciples' feet. He became the servant in the room. He humbled himself. And his lesson truly on that day was about humility. But the second lesson is one, I'm not sure I've caught it completely until I've had this aha moment just in the last week. A, a, an understanding of what Jesus was truly doing by washing their feet. That this was all about salvation. It was about foreshadowing the salvation to come. The pinnacle of Jesus' ministry was arriving. He knew he was headed to the cross in just a matter of hours, literally. That his ministry was coming to a close, that he was going to be crucified, buried in a tomb, and that he would raise from the dead. That second lesson is about salvation. When he came to Peter, Peter said, you're going to wash my feet? No, you shouldn't be washing my feet. You're Jesus. You're the head guy. You're the top dog in the room. We don't expect you to wash our feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. That's the biggest lesson. Jesus told them, said, you don't understand what I'm doing here, but afterward you will. After what? After he finishes washing their feet? After they finish the meal? No, after his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his teaching. We, we read in Luke 24 that he opened their minds so that they would understand the scriptures. Afterward, after all this takes place, they will understand. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless Jesus washes us, we have no part. That's the lesson of Jesus washing their feet. But how does he wash us? When Saul met Ananias, Saul on the road to Damascus, who became the Apostle Paul, was blinded. Ananias came to him and spoke what, what God needed him to, to share with Saul, 
who became Paul. And he touched him and he regained his sight. And he said to him, why, why do you wait? What are you waiting for? Rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. A washing. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Peter in Acts 2, after proclaiming the first gospel message, and the crowd said, what do we do? He said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. How does someone being lowered in water, being buried in water, bring a washing of sins? How is Jesus washing us in the water? Do you not know from Romans 6, 3 to 6, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That when we turn from this old world and embrace Christ calling up on him for salvation we are lowered into the water of baptism we are buried according to Romans 6 and when we are buried with Christ we are crucified with Christ that in some supernatural only God kind of way when we are buried with Christ every one of our sins that sinful person that is lowered into that water is crucified with Jesus on the cross. All our sins are transported up on him some 2,000 years ago. Even today, it, they will be transported onto the cross 2,000 years ago. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Unless I wash you, you have no part. You think as he's washing their feet in that room, you think this is humility. You just wait and see. Really, ultimately, he humbled himself by becoming one of us. But if you think this is humility, Washing your feet, you just wait. You haven't seen it yet. As if Jesus is saying to them, there is coming a moment of humility, which is that moment on the cross that will bring a washing like no other. Every first day of the week, as we are able we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again, according to 1 Corinthians 11. Paul addressing the church at Corinth. He, he writes in there, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Our sins have been transported to the cross of Jesus. We have been washed by Jesus so that we have a place with Him. Let's take a moment now and celebrate the cross. Celebrate the most humble act in all of history, God in the flesh, being killed by man on a cross. But more than the soldiers, more than the nails, more than the sword. It was His love for you that held Him there. Heavenly Father, in this time of communion and remembrance, draw us near. 
as we give thanks for having our old self crucified with Jesus on the cross. It's in his name I pray. Amen. The second le lesson we looked at at our VBS this past week comes from Matthew 25, 31 to 40, when Jesus said, serve the least of these. When you've done it unto me, he says, when you've done it unto the least of these, it's as if you've done it unto me. That's what Jesus said, unto me. You are serving me. As we look, we find Matthew 25. 31 to 34, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before for Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. As we looked at this lesson the other night when we came back in for our closing, some of our, our 
participants moved from the left side to the right because they wanted to be counted among the sheep. A shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It is common because of the, the nature of the sheep and goats, their temperaments. It's also for health reasons uh, so that diseases that, which can spread from one to the other doesn't take place. But there are various characteristics that separate sheep from goats. Sheep have wool, goats have hair. Goats have horns, it's very common. There are a, a breed of sheep, that some breeds that do have horns, but it's, it's not common among sheep. But goats, it's common to have horns, both male and females. It's common among goats, both male and females, to have beards. Sheep find comfort in being together and being led. Goats are more independent. And they'll go off on their own. And they'll go find their own food. And they'll go do their own thing. They don't worry about the herd. So perhaps Jesus chose the sheep and the goat because his original listeners would have been thinking, yes, yeah, sheep, they, they tend to like to be together, watching out for each other, but not the goats. They go off on their own way. They're independent. And in this parable, those who get to enter into rest, spend eternity with Jesus, are those who who gave those who were thirsty something to drink, those who were hungry something to eat, those who were homeless a place to live, those who needed clothing gave them clothing. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you've done these things to those in need, you've helped somebody in need, it's doing it unto me. They asked, well, when did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you... They didn't know that they were serving Jesus when they were helping someone else. And then on the other hand, the goats were saying, well, when did we see you thirsty and not give you something to drink? When did we see you hungry and not give you something to eat? The sheep and the goats were separated. The sheep are those who take care and they serve and they help. This past week, during our family VBS, we gave away 120 backpacks filled with school supplies. They went to four elementary schools and to MSEF to provide for families in need. Jesus called them the least of these. And that's not to diminish the value it's just the way in which he's saying those who need help. When you help them, it's as if you're helping me. And that brings you close to me. This is what I'm all about. Serving, helping, loving. That's what Jesus teaches. We, this past week, packed 50 diaper bags to go to the Pregnancy Resource Center to be given to Jesus. Families in need. We also packed 72 backpacks with toiletry supplies to go to the healing place. The healing place for men and the healing place for women. So both healing places. And we packed 500 lunches to serve through MOHO yesterday. Meals handed out. Great job, church in serving Jesus, in serving the least of these. In our last couple of nights at VBS, we focus more on the motives for serving. We discovered that the first motive is humility. That we are to humble ourselves. That's what Jesus did and he taught. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're not to look just to our own interests, 
but to the interest of others. Humility is the first motive that we ought to have in serving others as we continue. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In that upper room, among the disciples, they were arguing over who's the greatest, who's going to wash feet, who's going to be the servant. If a servant had been there, everyone around the table was willing to have their feet washed. If a servant was at the door, every one of them would have had their feet washed and not given much thought. I'll let someone wash my feet was their attitude. But I'm not washing someone else's feet. I'm not washing all this feet. All these feet. How about you? Can you humble yourself to serve others? Now the second motivation is love. The last night we looked at Galatians 5, 13 to 15. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Well, looks like more than one word. But that one word is love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In our text today, we find the greatest command is loving God through loving others. We are to love our neighbors as, our, as ourselves. When I was in second grade, we had a neighbor by the name of Billy Mitchell. When he came around, he was not nice, and he threw rocks at us, so we didn't want to play with Billy Mitchell. When he came around, the rest of us, we moved away, we ran to another place to play, because he was mean, and he threw rocks. When I was in fourth grade, uh, there was a new neighbor, and his name was Brian. He was in my class at school. Nobody wanted to be friends with Brian. He was slow to make friends. So I made him my friend. And I'd e even go to his house, which was not far. And we'd walk to school together early in the morning. When we bought our first house, we were moving in, and on that day, Becky met the neighbor next door before I did, and he said, are you all interested in buying that property behind your house? As we were on half a lot, and the lot behind it had a garage apartment that had burned. Well, uh, we don't, I don't know. We don't know anything about that property back there. Well, if it comes between $1,000 of you and me getting it, I'll get it. Welcome to the neighborhood. Nice neighbor. And when we moved from there four years later, we bought a house and our neighbor next door rarely talked to us. We didn't see him a lot, but when we did, he'd wave and say, pretty day, pretty day. We still say that now every once in a while. Pretty day, just mocking that neighbor from years ago. Then from there, we, we moved again. We relocated and next door, a young couple built a house and moved in, Mark and Shandy Cornelius, a Christian couple. And we got to be friends with them. When our third son was born, Corey, we took our older two boys in the middle of the night over to their house. And they kept them for us while we were off at the hospital. Christian people, who are easy to love. Out of all those neighbors, which ones are we called to love? 
all of them, the mean neighbors, the grumpy old neighbors, the neighbors that stand off, and even the ones that are easy to love. We're called to love our neighbors. Loving God by loving others. A group from a church was going into a low-income neighborhood and, and into an apartment complex handing out loaves of bread. And one couple that was out handing out bread came to an apartment and they heard arguing behind the door, but they went ahead and knocked anyway. The man came to the door and said, what do you want? He said, well, we're looking to see if, if you know anyone who might need some bread. We're giving out loaves of bread. Why are you doing that? To let people know that God loves them. What? What did you say? We're giving out bread in the name of Jesus to let people know that God loves them. A tear came to his eye. He said, we'll take some bread. Thank you. And when he closed the door, They heard him say to his wife, See, honey, I told you. I told you God hasn't turned his back on us. I told you God knows what we're going through. And they knocked on the door again. They came to the door. Oh, we wanted to know if there's anything we could be praying about for you. And with tears in his eyes, he said, we buried our three-week-old child yesterday. And we thought we were all alone and that God didn't care. Please pray for us. You might think you have no way to serve. Can you bake? Can you mow a lawn? Can you write a note of encouragement? Can you sit with someone, give someone a ride? There are so many ways that we can love our neighbors. And this past week, in those book bags, in the diaper bag, there are some notes that have been written. And who knows the difference one of those notes might make. And a note or an act of kindness that you show today and tomorrow, how that may change a life. Heavenly Father, help us open the doors of opportunities, open doors of opportunities for us to love people, to invest in people simply by serving and loving with humility. Here we are, use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Have you allowed Jesus to wash you? Not your feet, but to wash you clean from all your sin. Repenting of the old life embracing a new life in Christ, confessing Jesus as Lord, being buried in that watery grave of baptism, and in that water you are crucified with Christ. All your sins placed upon Jesus on the cross. And when you come up out of the water, it's like the resurrection. You are raised into a new life. The old life is gone and buried, crucified with Jesus. A new person, one who has been washed by, I guess you could say, the blood of Jesus, covered by the blood sacrifice of Jesus, washed by Jesus, who humbled himself, became one of us and humbled himself upon a cross to wash you. 
Have you accepted that washing? Have you said, yes, wash me, Jesus? If not, contact us, 804-779-2044, or go to our website, www.gethsemanechristians.org, clicking on the Connect Card icon, and indicate, I'm ready to be buried with Christ in baptism, immersed into the water. It is a humbling act. We all become one in the water. Very close to death, we can't live there. We die there spiritually. Our old person of sin dies there. And we come to life as we are raised from that watery grave, <gasps> taking that first breath of new life, filled with His Holy Spirit, a guarantee of heaven, a sign and seal belonging to Him. What are you waiting for? Contact us. Our baptistry will be ready. We will go into the waters. You can declare your allegiance to Christ. Call upon Him and be buried for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for the washing that comes through Jesus. We can't thank you enough but we know that we belong to Him. We have a part with Him when we humble ourselves and submit to His washing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.